Joyce Evans from the Institute of International Studies, and it's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker. This is one of the final presentations of the Nordic semester, and we're pleased to have two programs today focusing exclusively on Iceland. And Iceland is one of those countries that in the last five to ten years has just been gaining remarkable attention as a tourist destination. It's kind of a hot spot, if, if you would, of, of a destination place uh, because it's very affordable uh, to go to Iceland now. Our speaker is Ren Paulson, who is Deputy Chief of Mission for the Embassy of Iceland in Washington, D.C. And very pleased that uh, he accepted the invitation to come to Missouri Southern today. Uh, there's a brief bio of him in your program, but I'll share a couple of things with you that aren't in the program. He has lived in China, Russia, the UK, in addition to the United States. He met his wife, who is a Mexican citizen, at the American Embassy in Moscow. So what, what an international family they have. They have a one-year-old son, Ren's hobbies include hiking, reading, and history. So he's giving back-to-back -back presentations today. This one on understanding Iceland is more of a broad overview of Iceland. And then at, at noon, he's going to focus in more on Iceland and sustainable development in the Arctic North. So please join me in welcoming Ren Paulson. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Uh, let's, uh, as Chad said, I, uh, I am, uh, my name is Ren Paulson. I'm the Deputy Chief of Mission at the Embassy of Iceland in Washington, D.C. Uh, Deputy Chief of Mission means, uh, if you're in Austin Powers terms, the number two. So I'm the number two to the ambassador. Uh, Let's do, I think it would be a good idea just to uh, keep this as informal as we can. Uh, if you have any questions as I go on, uh, just raise your hands or, or you know, catch, my, catch my eye, and, and I'm happy to answer any and all questions that you have uh, related to the topics. Uh, as Jeff said, uh, I'm going to start off, uh, start off on, on uh, easy, so I'm going to give you a little bit of a, a historical, uh, cultural, and a little bit of a geographical overview of Iceland in my first presentation. And uh, those of you uh, who are interested more in the economy and, and the development issues and the uh, Arctic issues, uh, uh, that, that will be in my second presentation at the noon. So those of you, those of you for the, here for the light stuff, you can sneak off at, 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 at the intermission. All right, uh, let's start with uh, uh, the first slide. Uh, where is Iceland? This is usually the first question we get. Uh, uh, and it's uh, not easy to place uh, uh, unless you, you see the map. We're up there in the, in the North Atlantic, uh, midway between uh, Europe and, and uh, North America. And uh, uh, we are actually on the Atlantic Ridge that runs down the, the North Atlantic. Uh, Iceland is split into two. I am actually uh, uh, an American, because I'm born in Reykjavik, which is, uh, which is on the continental plate of North America. Because in the middle of Iceland, is splitting apart. A couple of millimeters a year, we're drifting apart on the tectonic plates between the Eurasian and the North American plates. So I'm an American, but uh, I have some other guys who are European that live on the other side. Now, a uh, uh, few uh, facts about Iceland, uh, just to, to get, us, get us started, is that we are a small country, uh, in, especially in population. We're only about 350,000. It's, a, it's important, those couple of thousand extra when, you, when you're, when you're uh, a small country. I was in China and I was trying to explain to my, my, my uh, counterparts, the Chinese, uh, uh, about Iceland. They said, so how many people live in Iceland? I said, 350,000. Ah, three, three, three and a half million. Yes, yes. I said, no, 350,000. Yes, yes, I understand. Three and a half million. They just didn't compute such a small country uh, existing and, 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 and dealing with the United States. But we are a small country and we are uh, uh, doing very well for ourselves. Uh, the country is, is, is about 103,000 square kilometers. That's about the size of Kentucky, as, you, as I think you have in your, in your information material. 
which is uh, uh, a reasonable size, but uh, all, the uh, all the population lives along the coastline. Because uh, 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 the center of the country is mainly uninhabitable, it is highlands and it's glaciers. Uh, there's often, uh, I'm often given the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the phrase that here in America that people say, ah, I know Iceland. Iceland is green and Greenland is icy, isn't it? And to a degree that's uh, true, but Iceland is actually also very icy. We have the largest glacier in, in, in Europe, in the Batmajökull, which is a huge chunk of, of, of ice, uh, which is, uh, 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 so we are icy as well, even though we're also green. Now, uh, uh, we have a few things that we will touch upon in, in, my, in, my, in, my, uh, uh, my, in the following, uh, following this. We are, uh, gender equality is an important issue in, in Iceland. Uh, we have a parliament, we have a democrat, democratic system that, that dates back to uh, 930. Beer was banned in Iceland until 1989. First of March 1989, there was no beer in Iceland. Unless the illegal ones, there were, there were a couple of those. And, uh, and uh, uh, we have special uh, issues which uh, I'm happy to discuss with you regarding our naming issues. We, our names are different. Uh, we, we use, I don't use my father's uh, first name as my last name. So there are a lot of cultural issues that are a little bit different, even though Iceland not only sits uh, physically between two continents and between America and Europe, we're also very culturally uh, influenced from both directions. Iceland is a Nordic country. We are, uh, we were, uh, as we will go through, we were uh, part of Norway, part of Denmark, and we've been influenced by, by Europe uh, through the years. But we also had uh, an American uh, military presence in Iceland uh, for the better half of, of the last century, which was a great influence to us, and I'll, I'll go into a little bit more detail about that. Uh, we are not very, uh, as you can see, uh, again, regarding where we are, we are at the top of the world, we are close to the Arctic. The northernmost island of Iceland it runs across the, the Arctic Circle, uh, uh, Grimse. Uh, so the, the weather in Iceland, you would assume, is very cold. Uh, it is not warm uh, in the summer, but it doesn't get very cold in the winter either. So it's, it's, it's very temperate, mainly thanks to the Gulf Stream that runs up from the Gulf of Mexico, up along the coast of the United States, and, and runs around Iceland. And that keeps us very temperate in, in climate and climate and temperature. temperature. Now I'll tell you a little bit about geology, we'll talk about history, a little bit about culture, and then, and then I'll touch about the economy, which will lead us into the second presentation uh, later today. Uh, geology. We already, already mentioned the tectonic plates. Uh, the, the Iceland, because of the tectonic plates moving apart, Iceland is very geologically volatile. There, there are earthquakes in Iceland almost every day. They're very small, but there's, uh, the earth is, is shaking, we're moving apart. There's a, uh, because of this uh, uh, volcanic activity, there is, there is geothermal heat underneath, so you have the geysers. So geyser is a name of Iceland's most famous geyser, which then has been uh, come as an anonym for all geysers in the world, uh, one of uh, the Icelandic Viking words. So, uh, so that's uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, elements of our geology, is that we have this volcanic activity. There is usually a volcanic eruption in Iceland so every three to five years. Uh, they're not huge. They happen in the highlands or on, on the coast. It's only when we have special kinds of volcanoes which disrupt flights all over the world <coughs> that, uh, that we get on the news usually. Uh, but that happened in 2010 with uh, the uh, uh, volcano called Eyjafjallajökull. That also gives you a little bit of a, 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 a sense of uh, that Icelandic is, is, a, is a special language and it's not easy to learn. Uh, we mentioned the glaciers, uh, uh, but also regarding the glaciers and because of geothermal activity and, 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 and all those issues, we have a lot of uh, very strong uh, rivers and uh, uh, glacial rivers. So we have a lot of potential hydro. We'll go to that as well in the second presentation. But there's a very strong, a uh, lot of waterfalls uh, and, and a lot of uh, uh, energy, both in the geothermal and in the hydro, based on our geography and, and, and the landscape that we live in. We have a couple of animals which are, 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 are native to Iceland. Uh, the puffin travels around, but we have an Icelandic horse, uh, which you can see, which some people call a pony. It's, it's a, a smaller horse, very sturdy little animal, uh, but it has been isolated in Iceland for a thousand years. There are no horses, horse imports to Iceland uh, for the last thousand years. And any, any time a horse leaves Iceland, it's not allowed to come back. It has to stay on a farm abroad. Uh, so, uh, and we also have indigenous foxes, but there are no animals in Iceland that are, we have no there are no poisonous insects, there's no, 
no uh, reptiles. Uh, so we are we're blessed, blessed, blessed with not having to worry about, about the uh, tiny critters and the poisonous little things. The vegetation uh, is, is, is mostly grassland. There's moss and lava fields and sands, and in the highlands we have the glaciers. There is a joke in Iceland, uh, which was, uh, well, back in the day when Iceland was settled, uh, the, uh, uh, the country was supposed to be forested. Uh, and it was much warmer in Iceland uh, during the settlement than it is actually today, even though we talk about global warming. Uh, and some, sometimes uh, the, uh, the time period when Iceland was settled, around, around 800, was actually a warmer period than we're experiencing now. So there was a lot more forest in Iceland, and then the Vikings came and they chopped it all down and made houses and boats and, and, and burned, uh, burned it for fuel. So there is a joke in Iceland at the moment that, uh, that if you get lost in an Icelandic forest, what do you do? You stand up. <laughs> because we're still trying to re, uh, reinvigorate the, the forestry in Iceland, and that's going very well. It's been a, a, been a project for a couple of, a couple of uh, decades now. So I'll just give you a couple of pictures to show you sort of a normal Icelandic landscape. This is, you see, don't, you don't see many trees, as, as, as you mentioned. This is a normal Icelandic landscape, a lot of grasslands uh, uh, and, 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 and fjords, uh, high mountains. This is uh, uh, lava fields, this is Thingvellir National Park in Nepal. Uh, this is where actually we can see the, the earth cracking and, 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 and drifting apart. This is uh, the exact point where America and Europe meet. Uh, black sand, uh, sands, uh, moving volcanic uh, uh, sands that, that, uh, that uh, give you that. And we have the glaciers uh, up there and, uh, and on top of the mountains, and more or less the glaciers crawling down from the mountains into, into the lagoons on the south coast, breaking off and, and floating off to the top of the, of the Atlantic. We also have some people living there in the city, so I didn't just want to uh, leave you with all those beautiful images of, of, of scenery, but we also have uh, this is the uh, downtown Reykjavik. Now, let's go into a little bit of history. I'm a history nerd, so, uh, so I, but I'll try to make this brief and, and concise as, as I can. Iceland was first settled, like I said, around 800, maybe a little bit before. Uh, the problem we don't, with why we, what we don't know about that is that it was first settled by Irish monks. And for obvious reasons, they did not reproduce very much. <laughs> So uh, the, they, 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 we have found some, some archaeological sites which indicate that they have been there. They sailed from Ireland up, up to Iceland and, and settled there in a few places, but uh, they, 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 they uh, died out. And then they were in 874, usually the, 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 the year would be uh, called for the use for the settlement of Iceland. That's when the Viking settlers came from Norway uh, to Iceland. Uh, we were. Uh, to use modern terms for this, we were political refugees. Uh, the, uh, in Norway, there was a civil war going on. Harald the Harfar, Harald the, the Beautiful Hair, was uniting Norway under one crown. And there was a lot of small fiefdoms, uh, little girls and dukes and, and, and so forth that didn't uh, get along very well with, uh, with Harald. And, and those who did not join him, they were not in a very good place uh, staying in Norway. So they took, took off and they went uh, sailing. Uh, towards the west. Uh, some uh, that got seasick, they went up in the Faroe Islands and we left them there, and uh, the more sturdy ones went over to Iceland <laughs> and settled there, uh, all around the country. Uh, but again, mainly around the coast, because uh, that's uh, where you have the, the, the effects of, 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 of being close to the water for fisheries and so forth. Uh, what these guys uh, did was they were not very, very happy with having a, a king, and that's why they left Norway. So they formed uh, a, 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 a parliament in the year 930 called Althing, which was a, 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 what we call a commonwealth. Uh, so they formed their own democratic system uh, during that time. We shouldn't assume it was a democratic system in the way that we understand it today. This was the chief things getting together and not having one keep them more important than the others. It wasn't like every, you know, every person had a vote. It was not, not a, a, a democracy in that sense, but it was a body, a, a, a deliberative body, made decisions, made law for the whole country and, and worked together. The, uh, through this body, uh, they made a decision in a couple of years later, in, in, in the year 1000, to become Christian. And Iceland has been a Christian country since, uh, since the year 1000. And that was also just done, uh, even though in many places, uh, uh, changes of religious beliefs were not very, very, uh, without uh, civil strife or, or, or conflict, but in Iceland it was. 
no civil strife. They actually, there was one gentleman who was the, was the Speaker of Parliament at the time. He went and he, he slept on it, that we should give up our Norse gods and become Christians. And he came out and he slept on it, came back and said, yes, let's do it. It seems like everybody's going this way, so let's go, go Christian on, like everybody else. But we'll keep some of the traditions. And, and every year we have a, uh, the, the blood festival, Thor, Thor blood, uh, where we eat very, very bad food. <laughs> so we still, even today, we still uh, carry on some of the tradition of the Norse, Norse uh, uh, religions, but we are and have been Christians for, for more than a thousand years. Some of you have, have heard maybe mention of the sagas. Uh, those are our literature works, uh, mainly sort of uh, dating back to the 12th century and, and then uh, uh, and after that. One of the most famous ones is, is, is uh, Heilskringla. It's uh, written by an Icelandic, uh, Icelandic called Snorri Sturluson, and uh, he writes about the, the, Nord the Nordic uh, universe, the gods of, of Nordic, the Odin and Thor, which you now can see in, in, in Marvel comic movies uh, more than, than in, 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 in books about uh, foreign religions. But uh, Odin and Thor and, and, and these, and again, uh, and Hemsley describes the, the world according to the Norse uh, uh, religion. Now, uh, even though they went uh, uh, after they, they, they tried this, this commonwealth democracy thing for a while in Iceland, but in 1200s, 1240, uh, and, and for about a couple of years after that, 1262, we had a civil war in Iceland. So these chieftains who were, had their own little commonwealth, they, they didn't really get along, and so they started fighting each other. So in the end, we decided to uh, ask the Norwegian king to basically become a peacekeeper uh, to establish peace in Iceland. So they, they, uh, they gave authority to the uh, become the king of Iceland as well. Uh, Iceland became part of the kingdom of, of Norway in the year 1262. Then, uh, there, uh, as some of you have been studying some of the Nordic uh, countries, you know that uh, there was a short period in, 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 uh, in 1397, it was called the Kalmar Union, where you had all the, uh, the Scandinavian countries. I'm not I'm using the word Scandinavian purposely, because we use the term Nordic when we include Finland and, and, and Iceland. But Iceland and Finland were not uh, separate entities at the time. So Scandinavian countries were united in the Calvary Union. And when that broke off uh, a few years later, uh, Iceland, uh, somebody forgot about Iceland was part of Norway, and we just you know, carried on being part of Denmark from, from there on. And we were part of Denmark for more, more than 500 years after that. So that gets us to the Middle Ages and Enlightenment. Now I've been babbling along, and, and are there any questions or anything that you want to ask about this? You can also take questions at the end if you <coughs> well, let's jump uh, to another period of history. We'll go to the history of the birth of the nation state, how uh, Iceland became a country. Like I said, we were 500 years, we were under the Danish, Danish crown. It wasn't until 1874, at the thousand year anniversary of, of the establishment of Iceland, that the Dan uh, Danish king gave Iceland its own separate constitution. Uh, and as you know, here in the United States, there, there, to have a constitution is, is, is an important thing. It sets, sets the basis for, for, for the, the, the government. Uh, Now, in 1904, we received Home Rule, and for those of you who also have studied uh, some of the uh, uh, other Nordic countries, uh, some of you may have heard, of, of course, of Greenland, and, and uh, maybe a few have heard about the Faroe Islands. They are part of the Kingdom of Denmark uh, today. They are in basically in the same situation as we were in 1904. They have Home Rule, but they are, uh, but they are, are part of the Kingdom of Denmark. So we had a Danish king, but we had a, a governor in Iceland uh, who ran it. And in 1918, 100 years ago, when, uh, uh, we uh, were uh, made a sovereign country. This was following the Second World War, where there was a lot of establishment between countries going on, uh, and Iceland was, was part of that. So again, we became uh, Denmark, the King of Denmark became the King of Denmark and Iceland. We were no longer part of the Kingdom of Denmark, we were a separate kingdom, so we had two crowns, one for Iceland and one for, 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 uh, for, uh, for Denmark. And that situation uh, ran up until the Second World War, when we had the uh, uh, occupation of Denmark by Nazi, Nazi forces, by German forces. Uh, and uh, at that time, in the, uh, the agreement that was made in 1918, we had the, uh, a, a clause in the contract of Denmark that we would break away if, uh, if, if at certain times we, we felt uh, make a notification and, and uh, neither party had, had to disapprove. And Denmark being under, under German rule, did not disapprove. So uh, in 1944, Iceland became a, a, a republic. 
Precursor to that are the two years that I put there as well, the 1940 and 1941. In 1940, Iceland, 10th of May 1940, uh, the British uh, decided to occupy Iceland. That's because Iceland at that time is still sometimes referred to as a huge uh, aircraft carrier, unsinkable aircraft carrier in the middle of the North Atlantic. Uh, and you had the Battle of the Atlantic starting, the Nor uh, Germans had, 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 had occupied Norway and had chances to have sent the uh, mainly U-boats into the Atlantic to disrupt the uh, 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 convoys coming from the United States into, into the UK for the war effort. So it was very important for the British to, to occupy Iceland, to get there, from there first, because the Germans actually had plans to go there as well. So Icelanders were not consulted in this. The, 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 on the 10th of May, we saw ships on, on, on the horizon, and everybody was there with their binoculars seeing, is it the Germans or is it the, is it the British? Uh, and uh, most people were very relieved when, uh, when they realized it was the British not the Germans. So Iceland became, uh, 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 was, was occupied by the British forces. Uh, but the British were, were uh, in a tight spot. They were still fighting this mostly alone. France had been occupied, most of Europe had been occupied. And uh, they were in a tight spot. This was before the United States joined the war. So one of the first things that happens, uh, one of the first things that Franklin Delano Roosevelt does to assist uh, the British in, in, in the Second World War uh, is actually taking over Iceland's defenses. And that relieves the, the British contingent in Iceland to go out to fight in Africa. Poor guys coming from Iceland all the way to Africa. Neither of those places may be, may be congenial to the British if, uh, you know, environment. But uh, so that's what happens. So way before uh, uh, Pearl Harbor, a couple of months before Pearl Harbor, the, the United States actively takes a decision to overtake, to take over the defenses of Iceland and, and, and relieve the British forces. And that's what happens. And that is a precursor to the establishment of the Republic of Iceland in 1944, and the United States was the first country to recognize the independence of Iceland. Uh, then we come into the Cold War period. Iceland is a founding member of, of NATO. In, in 1949, we, we joined uh, NATO. We have a special uh, peculiarity about Iceland. Is Iceland does not have any armed forces. We are 350,000. We have a large uh, territory to, to defend. Uh, and at the time, which I'll mention a little bit more, more in, 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 in my, my second presentation, Iceland was relatively very poor at the time. Uh, so poor, small country did not have the means to defend itself uh, militarily. So uh, we did not have our forces, and we still do not have any armed forces today. We, we serve a lot, and for those interested, I can give you a little bit of a background about Iceland and defense security. But but at, uh, to this day, Iceland does not have any armed forces. But we are still a founding member of NATO. Uh, in 1951, the situation that is established in 1941 is made on a more permanent basis. But now it's not to defend against Germans. This is the Americans uh, uh, one asking Iceland, can we please set up facilities in Iceland uh, to defend against the Soviet Union? And mainly that is for submarine warfare, uh, for, uh, for airplanes. Uh, to, uh, to monitor the oceans around Iceland. If you think about the, the map back here, we'll go back to the map here. There you go. This area here, between Iceland and Greenland and Greenland and the United, United Kingdom, is called the Duke Gate. And this is where all submarine traffic from Russia, that comes out of Murmansk up here, has to go to get into the North Atlantic. So for, for, for strategic purposes, the United States was very keen on setting up a Navy base in, in Iceland. And that was uh, 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 agreed on in 1951. That also relieved Iceland. Uh, what Iceland got out of it, we got military protection from the United States. So we are not, we're not only partners in NATO, but Iceland and the United States have a bilateral one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, relationship regarding defense and security uh, in, a, in addition to that. Uh, I also want to touch upon, and this goes into the leads on into the second presentation as well, that's the, the COD works. Not many people have heard about the COD wars, I assume. But we love beating the British. We beat them at football in, in the Euro Cup yeah. at their own game. And the second thing is, 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 uh, is fishers and, and to beat the British Navy. And that was the COD wars in, in 19, there were three times. It was the first, second, and third COD wars, 58, 72, and 76. And this is to extend the, the, the fishing grounds surrounding Iceland. The, the economic exclusion zone, as it's called, uh, uh, out from the, from the coastline, uh, so as to move 
British and at that time German uh, uh, trawlers uh, who were scraping up all the fish uh, unregulated uh, and, 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 and uh, uh, from, from underneath our nose. So in the Cod Wars, this was an international movement at the time was to extend the economic exclusion zones uh, and Iceland uh, uh, took part in this and was uh, uh, at the forefront of this and still Iceland is very much at the forefront of the, the law of the sea. So we have uh, quite a few experts uh, and even judges in the UN courts of the law of the sea. Uh, so this is one of the niches that Iceland has, has, has caught on to uh, being a, a island in the middle of the ocean. Now, last slide about history uh, uh, is uh, in 1980 we elected the first female head of state. Uh, uh, Ms. Vivi Simbodotic was elected uh, the head of state. This is based on, uh, on a movement in Iceland of gender equality. Iceland uh, also is, 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 is at the forefront of, of uh, gender equality issues uh, and with, along with our Nordic friends. Uh, and and we, we, we try to uh, speak up for these rights uh, in, in our international development programs and, and, and in various other ways. But Big it was uh, a very, uh, and still is, she's, she's still alive, uh, a very uh, prominent uh, lady, uh, a very successful president of the country. But uh, being the first in the world, she, she gained the international attention for, for being the first elected head of state. In uh, 1986, we had a, a, a summit in Iceland, which we all take uh, very proud of. And those of you who have studied the Cold War will have heard about the Hedley or the Reykjavik summit, which was uh, in many respects uh, and sometimes viewed as the beginning of the end of the Cold War. Uh, the, the Soviet Union at the time was, 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 was uh, not keeping up with Ronald Reagan's uh, 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 armor programs and, and, and was basically buckling under, under the expenses of, 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 uh, of uh, having having to, to keep up the arms race with the United States. And, and Gorbachev, uh, who I actually met when I was in, in Russia, very, very nice uh, uh, he, he came to the summit uh, basically saying, we would like to, to, uh, to draw down the nuclear arms race. But uh, there were issues regarding uh, uh, other weapon programs that were uh, uh, Then in Iceland, in 1994, Iceland joins the EEA, which is the European Economic Area. Iceland is not a member of the European Union. Uh, even though we're a European country, we're not a member of the European Union. We're a member of a smaller club uh, <coughs> called EFTA, European Free Trade Association, and we join that club with our, our, our cousins, the Norwegians, the Swiss, and the Liechtensteiners. So it's a small, rich people, uh, uh, rich, rich country club. Uh, and, and, uh, and, uh, but we have an agreement with the, United, with the European Union, so we have free access to the European Union. Uh, if, you, if you are a foreign, foreigner who needs a Schengen visa to go to Europe, Iceland is part of the Schengen area. So you can, you can travel, Iceland is part of a lot of uh, European regulations uh, uh, in regards to uh, uh, trade and, 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 and the movement of, of services and goods to, to, to the East. In 2006, the United States uh, decides to close its, its, its naval base in Iceland. Uh, basically, this is, uh, symbolizes in us, for us the end of the Cold War in Iceland. The U.S. is fighting a new war uh, in the Middle East, in Iraq, uh, in Afghanistan, and requires the resources there. So the base is closed, and people pay what is called the peace dividends uh, of the, after, after the end of the Cold War. So, uh, so that's uh, that's how, how 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 the closing of the base has has, has, has occurred. Uh, and today we are seeing with the resurgence of Russia and Russian activities in, in their na neighborhood that the United States is actually coming back to Iceland. Uh, with, with uh, 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 both for submarine hunting, they're also participating in air policing missions. They're not there on a permanent basis, uh, and, and I doubt that will be uh, that, that, that will be the case. But there is, uh, of course, a renewed interest within NATO, within the United States, about security and defense issues in the North, uh, uh, in relation to the Russian uh, activities uh, in their near area. And then uh, we had, uh, that goes with the, the Freddy cartoon over there, that's we had an economic crash in Iceland. Iceland is not new to economic, uh, well, volatile economic cycles would be the polite way to put it. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we've had ups and downs. Our economy was based on fisheries for the most part of, of the previous centuries. And fish come and go. They don't go and stay uh, uh, in one place necessarily for three years and years. We had a herring adventure in the cold. We had a lot of herring. We made millions and millions and millions, and then we overfished, and it was gone. And then the economy crashed. So this 
this also happened a few months late. I didn't have the uh, idea that we were going to be a financial center in the middle of the Atlantic. It didn't go very well. Uh, we had on one day after the Lehman Brothers crash, uh, uh, the interbanking uh, loans closed up. The Icelandic banks were, were very leveraged in short-term loans. So when it came to our time to refund those loans, there were no banks to lend the money to them. So in the span of one week, all three major Icelandic banks, who all had international presence in China and in the UK and the Netherlands and various other places, all collapsed in one week. Uh, I was actually in China uh, on, a trip, on, a, on a work trip at the time. And I did not know if my, my visa card was going to work or not. It was a very strange time, very strange time. So my press, the Prime Minister was on the TV giving a speech. He was now actually my, my ambassador in, in, in Washington, but just saying, you know, God bless Iceland, we're, 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 uh, we're in a bad shape. Uh, fortunately, the, the, uh, the uh, government at the time and the, pre uh, and, and, and the government that followed on made very good uh, uh, decisions uh, in a bad situation. We made what we call the emergency laws, which guaranteed the, the, uh, uh, the people who had money in the banks did not lose their money. Uh, the people who had lent money to the banks and people who had invested in the banks were the ones who took the brunt of, 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 of the, uh, uh, the loss. But this set the stage for a, 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 a resurgence in the economy quite quickly. Uh, we got a, a big boom in tourism. The, with the economy crash, the currency crash uh, became more affordable to go to Iceland. Uh, so, uh, and a lot of resources were, were, were released after the economic crash. Uh, and uh, people who have been working in very high paying banking jobs were out of jobs. All of us took pay cuts. Not just in the sense of that our, 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 our salaries bought less, but they also meant also that a lot of people lost their jobs. It was not an easy time for a couple of years. But all these people found were, were highly motivated, uh, innovative people, and went into other countries <coughs> and has created a situation today that Iceland has the, the fourth largest GDP in the world, following Norway and Macau. Uh, so even with a crash, <coughs> still, uh, now we're back in a very good place, and it's, it's, it's less than so Iceland has this up and down kind of kind of cycle. cycle. So I'll lead shortly into the economy, but I'll address that better in, in my second second presentation. Uh, the, the economy in Iceland we usually say is, is, is split into four sectors, four four different different. And this is uh, starting with the, the old uh, uh, is the which may, used to be the main industry in Iceland is fishing. Uh, that has uh, changed, and I will tell you a little bit more about the changes later. But fisheries is about a quarter of the economy. Then we have a uh, heavy industry based on the uh, 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 hydro and geothermal potential and energy production. So we have some heavy industry on wood smelters, silicon uh, factories, and various other, other aspects like that. Then we have a high tech industry. This is already started before the crash, but it's what was, was reinforced during the crash. So we have companies who make uh, uh, food processing equipment. Computerized, we have people uh, making prosthetics for people who lose, uh, lose their uh, limbs. We have companies who make uh, skin grafts out of, out of fish. So all these things, so we have a lot of innovation uh, and that's supported by the government as well to try to get that innovation going and that's about a quarter of the economy. And then the biggest part of the economy at the moment is the tourism industry, which is, uh, has gone up and we'll show you some graphs later on uh, how the boom has just sort of hit us out of the blue. Now culture, uh, where are we time-wise on it? Yeah. We're, uh, I'll go quickly through the culture and then I'll, I'll, we'll have about 10 minutes of questions or so. So uh, we have uh, uh, literature, music, film, performing and visual arts. And as I mentioned before, we have a lot of European and US influence in our culture. Now literature-wise, uh, uh, we mentioned the sagas, which is the history of the, of the Nordic uh, people and, and, and the religion. That is a, a base of our, our uh, base, uh, is, is, is our castles and, 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 and uh, is the most important thing to our history. It's, like, it's our historical thing, historical thing. If you go to places like Germany or England, you'll see these beautiful castles and, and, and medieval structures. We don't have any of them. We're very poor. Uh, but uh, the sagas are our prestige. It's where our, what, what our, our uh, ancestors did and what they left, left for us. Uh, we have the, the most uh, Nobel Prize laureates, but then comes the, uh, the caveat, per, per capita. <laughs> <laughs> Icelanders love per capita, because we're the greatest investors in everything in the world if you just take per capita. 
So we have one Nobel laureate for literature, it's Mr. Uh, Aldo Laxness, uh, who wrote very, very interesting books and very good books. Uh, one of the most famous ones is Independent People, uh, a, a very famous uh, and very, very interesting book. We also now have a part of this new uh, uh, wave of, of Nordic literature. I, I read in some papers that you have some Nordic noir uh, literature clubs and, and, and various things here, uh, here, here at, at the university. Iceland has two very prominent uh, uh, in this uh, crime uh, uh, novelists, Issa uh, Sigurd uh, and Arnaldur. They both have written uh, a lot of books that have got, gotten wide circulation and are, are famous uh, uh, worldwide. Plus, of course, we have very talented poets and, 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 and authors who are also making it on the international stage. Uh, mainly in Europe, I would say, uh, rather than here in the US, but also we have quite a few more coming here and are being published here in the US. Uh, music advice, people say like 350,000 people, how can you produce? Because you've probably heard some of these, you know. Probably not state stay there, so sort of that I'm putting in there as sort of the show that we do classical music as well. Uh, and then we have classical, mu uh, classical musicians and, and that as well. But uh, many of you have heard about York, uh, in the Swan Dress, the famous one from, from the Emmys. Uh, some of you have heard about Siguros, uh, uh, which is a, a, a sort of a, a, a indie band. And you would probably at least recognize the songs of Monsters and Men, even though you may not know the name, but it was, uh, it was in, in the top chart here in the US along with a few other bands who are doing very well in the international states. So for 350,000, uh, the population of 350,000, we've done, we've been able, uh, been lucky enough to have very talented people come uh, and make it big on the international stage. And there are some studies about how does that happen and uh, that, that you get uh, this kind of, of talent. Most of it, as I said, it works with you that you're a small country because people who are from a small country, they, they get uh, locally recognized and then move on to the international stage. Easier to get recognized in a small community and then move on uh, to the international one. So I don't know, but, but very talented and very successful musicians have had come out. Now the film industry has been, been uh, 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 also uh, gaining traction in Iceland, mostly as a location, uh, shooting for, for, for big films. Uh, we had the, uh, uh, the new, we had two Batman movies, uh, we've had two James Bonds, we've had two Tomb Raider. Uh, Game of Thrones, most of you probably recognize, been filmed in Iceland and still being. We've had the Star Wars movies being filmed in Iceland, the Fast and the Furious being filmed in Iceland, and I could go along, you know, on and on and on with the blockbuster movies. And that's uh, made, uh, it's been very good for us, not uh, uh, just because it's uh, nice to have your name and your scenery seen in, 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 in big movies, but also it gave, gives the people, the, the local crews in Iceland, uh, uh, some experience with, with very talented people, mostly coming from the United States working in the, in the international film industry, giving them experience and, 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 and expertise and funding to, 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 to uh, develop their skills. And that has meant that the Icelandic uh, industry has, has, been, has been gaining traction and we have some very good movies. Uh, uh, Woman Goes to War is now our nominee for, for uh, the Oscars and has been giving very good reviews here in the US. We also have kids uh, productions. Uh, some of you have, uh, have seen Lazy Town on Nickelodeon back in the day. Uh, and uh, we have uh, uh, some prominent out of this pool of people who are working on, on the international movies. We have uh, uh, Baltasar Korma, who is an Icelandic director, done a few movies. Everest uh, uh, was one of them, if uh, uh, you remember that one. And, uh, and some movies with Dustin Washington and uh, uh, yeah, Contraband is one of them. So, uh, and then this trapped TV show is now on, on, on international distribution on Netflix, actually, I think, rather than. And uh, we have some visual art as well. We have an Ola Brelioson, who's a bit famous visual artist. He's an Iceland Dane, uh, Danish artist. And Kjartan uh, Ragnarsson uh, has been forgotten, was, uh, was, uh, has been uh, a, a visual artist who's been gaining a lot of attention worldwide uh, in the last couple of years. And we have a photographer called uh, uh, Rax, who's been uh, documenting the, the life of people in, in the Arctic and, and the environment and the changes in the Arctic, which has also gained quite a lot of art. We have a, uh, have a Nordic exhibition. If any of you have, uh, are coming out to DC for, for uh, in the next three months, there is a Nordic exhibition at the Philips Collection in DC, uh, a retrospective of uh, 150 years of, of Nordic art uh, uh, taking place there. So if, if you're in the neighborhood, that you can about it. Hey, voila. I think we have about eight minutes for questions. <laughs> That's, that's
that's that's the strange thing. There is uh, there is really not a season for tourism in Iceland because it depends on what you want to do. We're, we're busy all year round. I had a a, a, a gentleman from from uh, NATO asking if they could bring a 400 person conference to Iceland in September of next year, and I said that's not going to be possible because finding a hotel to, to house 400 people with only one year's notice, everything's full already. Because, because the tourist season is all year round. It is very busy, and I'll show you some graphs in my second presentation, but the tourist season is all year round. The, they've managed to uh, market Iceland for the winter season as well. So there isn't a downtime. If people come in the summer for three months, and then you know, everything's done. It's actually all year round, the hotels are full. And, uh, and, and as Kat said, I said earlier, we, we, we have a little bit of a, you know, a, a special thing. You said that it's cheap to go to Iceland. Yes, it's cheap to get there, but then you have to stay there. <laughs> it's not as cheap to stay there, but it's a wonderful place. And, and, and we are, our infrastructure is catching up uh, to the demand that is, is overwhelming for a small country. We have about almost two and a half million tourists coming to Iceland for a population of 250,000. Yes, sir. At the moment, we have a special task force in, in the foreign ministry and, uh, and an officer in, in London who are working solely on the Brexit issues. There are uh, complications, of course. Uh, the UK is one of our largest export markets. The US is our single largest <coughs> individual country export market, but the UK comes very close. Uh, there are opportunities, I'm sure. Uh, there have been some issues that, through the EA agreement that we're not, uh, uh, we were not happy with. At the end, but but there are some opportunities to make a new deal uh, that will benefit uh, both us and them. It uh, uh, will not take the dimension of, of the whole European Union into consideration. We'll be more focused on the on the bilateral uh, issues and trades that there. But that is still up in the air, uh, as, as so many other things regarding Brexit at the moment. So, so we're waiting to see how things will develop. Uh, but we're trying. We had a meeting uh, of our, our ministers with our, their counterparts in, in the UK to try to. Uh, uh, at least, and now uh, there is at least established that there will be for those who are living in each other's countries and try to make things as easy to transition uh, from the uh, EEA to another uh, uh, agreement or, 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 or a situation. Yes, sir. Let me use my bucket list to, yes. to drive the ring road. Yes. And uh, when in looking at what kind of services, there's not a lot that I other than some Airbnb, but I wondered if any of the developers <coughs> moving outside, how far outside the city centre? Some of it is, some of it is, but uh, it is a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a double-edged sword, uh, to say, because one of the reasons people go to Iceland is that they don't want too much development. But then again, <coughs> you want a hot shower, you want a coffee bed as well, so. Uh, so it, 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 it's, it's a given thing. Yes, uh, there are clusters of, on, on certain areas in the country that are, are building up, uh, and uh, uh, but it is it is still in development. So we can get gas. I mean, you can get gas. You can pool all around. Yeah, 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 that's no problem. No problem. Sorry, yes, sir. Yes. Uh, yeah. How is the recent rise in authoritarianism in places such as Brazil and Poland affected Iceland? And 
not directly. Not directly. Not directly. We've had, uh, we've, after the economic crash, there was a large uh, uh, disturbance in the political environment. People were very unhappy with, with, uh, with, with things that were going on. So there was an upheaval. And out of that upheaval, we used to have about four main political parties. At the moment, we have about eight, nine political parties in a very small country with a very few seats in Holland. So that has made, made, meant that this has, has, has changed a little bit the politics of the situation. But we've not had this authoritarian element. We've had what we call the pirate party, which uh, rose out of this situation. But they are not an authoritarian. They are more liberal, uh, uh, ultra-liberal party uh, in many, many respects. So we have not uh, seen this. We've had a few, uh, uh, we had a small following, less than a, you know, a part of the percentage uh, for a nationalistic party, but that was zero point something percentage at the last election that they didn't gain any traction. So we have, fortunately, we've been, we have avoided uh, the authoritarian and uh, the ultra-nationalist uh, uh, elements that some, in some places have, have been, have been uh, poking through uh, in politics around the world. Are we, uh, yes, I think we're exactly finished. So uh, those of you who want to live, hear, hear more about economy and, 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 and trade and stuff, I will, I, will, I will follow it up uh, uh, after the break. But I'll put it on the video.